Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 590, Seeing Eye, Meet Creating Mouth. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am kind of tired this morning, but it's because of awesomeness. Holy cow. So last week, apologies, I had birthday fets on Thursday night that went late. So there was no way I was going to be able to record in time on Friday morning. And then Saturday, we went into New York City to go see the skin of our teeth at Lincoln Center. It's only going to be running for another two and a half weeks after you hear this. This is going out Friday, May 13th, 2022. I have never seen a skin of our teeth this good. I am going to link out to a video of the dinosaur puppets, the giant dinosaurs that come through the front door. Skin of our teeth is very strange. Thornton Wilder, who did Our Town, is well known for kind of the minimalist. Like, Our Town doesn't have a set. There are chairs, but there are no tables. So (laughs) it makes miming eating breakfast really interesting and cooking breakfast really interesting. We had to tape onto the floor the dimensions of our house and our kitchens so that me, Mrs. Webb, and oh my gosh, the other mother, I'm blanking on her name. Uh, We knew where we were supposed to be and we had to tape out like, here is where our stove would be and here's where the wood box is and here's where a sink is. That's our town. Skin of our teeth, not like that at all, except there is an actor who comes on stage as a stage manager in the second and third acts. So that's kind of fun. But I have never seen anything like this before. It was a multi-ethnic, really broad range of ages cast. And I have to tell you, having seen it this way, I cannot imagine it being done well any other way. I will link out to an article on the director and the decisions that she made because they were brilliant. The sets were brilliant. I have not seen the kids' jaws drop like this ever. Hamilton didn't do to them what this show did to them live. So, wow, just wow, huge wow. If you can get there to see it, please do, because the place was only about half full when we went, and that's a travesty. Uh, Everybody's masked. Everybody has to show proof of vaccinations. Beg, borrow, steal, hop a train, do whatever you have to. Please, 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 if you are anywhere near New York City, get to the theater and see this thing because wow, just incredible. Why am I still tired? Because last night was our last night of birthday fet-iness and I didn't know what we were doing. So uh, Andrew drove me and Thing 2 down to Philly and we met up with Thing 1. Aaron, Thing 1 is about to leave to go to Los Angeles for an internship for the whole summer. So we won't see him for his birthday. He will miss the trip to the beach this year. It is so weird having the kid go to LA. He's gotten an internship at a marketing and advertising company. They just do work in LA for TV and film. And uh, I'm very excited If you would like to connect him to someone in the industry who you know, please, please, please feel free. I am going to link out to many things for Aaron this time. First, his website. Second, his YouTube channel. And third, on his YouTube channel, his junior film, which is done and complete and was shown and got really, really good notices and good laughs. And I maintain that one of the reasons why his film stood out from all the others that we saw 
was because this kid has worked really, really hard on the writing. And part of the writing is timing. And it's one thing to get the timing right in the written word, but it is another thing entirely to extract acting out of voice actors virtually that get the timing right as well. And he did. Two of the voice actors that you will hear are young professionals. One actually is a paid professional. The other one is trying to become one. And the third is one of the two kids that we used to live near in Virginia, whose parents are both fabulous actors as well. So it is just a very small world. Actually, I'm going to link out to another thing that Aaron's been doing with our friend's son. I don't have their permission to share his name. I didn't even think about asking for it. So I won't mention him by name until later. But either way, they are working on some things with another friend of Aaron's from Dufus del Fuego days. That is how long Aaron has been friends with this other kid. The bulk of their friendship has been on Skype and Discord. They are uh, they are never going to stop working together because they've kind of both grown into this creative world where they they write and collaborate and draw and design. And that is part of what I'm going to link out to. They have a podcast, these three kids, now called Kill the Writer. And I think I may have mentioned that I was a guest host on their podcast. Uh, we recorded it a couple of months ago. They are learning that editing audio takes longer than recording audio. Thank you, Justin. So, so many cool and exciting things. So dinner with Aaron last night, and then we are walking over to the Kimmel Center. And I led us to the Kimmel Center. And then Andrew said, actually, I don't know if this is the right theater. I think we might be in the one around the corner. And so we turn around the corner and there is a line. There is a line like David Bowie has come back from the dead and is doing a one night concert. There is a line around the side of the building. The doors have been opened for a while now, and there is still a line that stretches all the way down to the end of the block. Admittedly, it's a short block, but still, it's a block long. And I'm looking at this mix of people. You have ages from 12, 10, 12 years old, all the way up to quite elderly and walking with canes and a walker. I noticed an extraordinary number and variety of full arm length tattoos, as well as, you know, much smaller tattoos. Lots of multicolor dyed hair, both on men and women. I am looking at this crew thinking, I cannot possibly come up with any kind of explanation for what we're about to do. And I told Andrew, I like surprises. I am, I am very happy to not know until the last minute. <laughs> as we are standing in line, thing to Aiden, who is now 18, I can say his name. Aiden turns to me and says, so you really don't know where we're going? I said, no, I mean, I know we're going to this theater, but I don't know why. And they said, well, I can tell you this. Dad is going to have a great time. Aaron is going to have a great time. You are going to have a great time. I am not going to be able to be on my phone. And I said, oh, are you not going to enjoy this? And he said, it'll be, it'll be nice, but I am not going to be able to be on my phone. And so I was kind of sad because I thought, oh, well, that's not a great, a great birthday present then. And then we got inside and I, I'm looking at all the playbills. The place is packed. I'm looking at all the playbills and it looks like it's a concert that we're going to. And it's not Audra McDonald, but I can't see the cover closely enough because they're not handing out playbills anywhere. So this is weird. So we sit down and Andrew cannot contain himself. He can't wait for the thing to actually start. There is a podium draped in blue cloth with a table next to it, upon which there is a water glass and a water pitcher. And I'm like, okay, so this is a one person thing. So maybe it is a concert, although it's kind of weird to have a podium and a table, but okay, whatever. Andrew cannot contain himself, thrusts the e-ticket to me, and it says, an evening with Neil Gaiman. So I squeal, and Aiden said, see, I knew you and dad and Aaron would be excited. And I said, how are you not excited about this? And Aiden said, I, you know, I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson is nice and all, but I mean, I've seen him on TV and stuff. And I said, Aiden, read. And I pointed to the e-ticket and he said, wait, Neil Gaiman? I get to see Neil Gaiman? Oh my gosh, this is going to be, I thought it was Neil deGrasse Tyson. And hilarity ensued. It was 
lovely. He read from several short stories, one of which I had known from before. The other was Click Clack and the Rattlebags, which, yikes. He had very funny stories. He had very funny stories of him and Terry Pratchett working together. He had news about Good Omens. They are in the editing and VFX phase of the second series. And he said the second series is bridge material. It's what you needed to have to get to series three. Series three is the last chunk that he and Terry Pratchett had uh, plotted out very carefully. So I don't know how season two is going to be, but I can pretty much guarantee you that season three, which they are starting work on, is going to be spectacular. The other thing he said was uh, he had note cards and people had sent in questions. And one of those questions was, what was something that happened to you today that made you joyful? And he said, ooh, that's an interesting question. And so he thought about it and he said, earlier in the day, he was up in New York before he came down to Philly. And he'd gone with his, I think it was his editor, to the Fountain Pen Hospital. And I've made a link for you out to the Fountain Pen Hospital, both a video on them and a link to their site. They are a Fountain Pen Hospital. They also sell new fountain pens as well. And so he was testing a bunch of fountain pens. And the one he picked was a Namiki Falcon fountain pen. The tip is a little bit flexible. And, and he said it was just a, a lovely thing to write with. And his editor said, you know, I've missed several years of lunches with you. So I, I think I owe you two birthday presents. So his editor bought the pen for him, which was very sweet. He also said he got it in blue, so it would be harder to lose. And that when he signs books, he prefers to use a broad nib. But when he is writing just for himself, he goes with medium to fine. So there is some Little trinkets of information from Neil Gaiman that I managed to remember for you. What else? Murderbot Diaries. Several people Thursday night had read The Murderbot Diaries by Martha Wells. Andrew read these a couple of years ago, and I thought, ah, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. It didn't make sense to me because the last time I'd heard of a murderbot, <laughs> it was that little robot that they tried to send around the world. And it was found dead on the side of the road in just outside Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, which is both ironic and tragic, which I guess is just ironic. Murderbot Diaries are nothing like that. They are comedy. They are dark comedy, but largely they're mysteries. And it's just kind of like being inside the head of a Vulcan who's watched way too many hours of serialized television. So funny not necessarily funny, haha, -ha, but funny, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, I get it. Very clever. I would be lying to you if I didn't believe very firmly that Martha Wells must have read the Expanse books because she seems to be drawing on world building that happened in the Expanse. I am not positive about that, but it seems likely. So if you like the Expanse books, I think you will very much like the Murderbot Diaries. Okay, what else? Next Tuesday is Election Day, primary day here in. Pennsylvania. So I will be out doing that work because I got elected. Did I tell you that? I think I did. I got elected to be majority inspector of elections for Solbury Lower One. That is our voting district. So I won't be at the Tuesday morning Zoom call next week either because I'll have already started working. But next Thursday, God willing and the creeks don't rise, I will be back on Zoom Thursday night. So please, if you have primaries in your area, vote please vote. Please vote and please tell everyone you know between the ages of 18 and 35 to get off their butts and vote. Very important because their future depends on it. Not mine. I don't have that much more future left. <laughs> I am feeling my age, but that's okay. That's okay. As long as everybody goes to vote. That said, we have a different campaign to wage. We have a campaign with Joan. Today, we have three chapters for the recollections of Joan of Arc. We have uh, chapter nine, Joan is made general in chief. We have chapter 10, the maid's sword and banner. And chapter 11, the war march has begun. None of these are particularly long or heavy. I will talk to you more about the sword and banner after because it kind of matters, I think. 
So maybe not manners in the big picture, but I think it's interesting. And I think that those of you who have worked in textiles will also find this kind of interesting as well. And there are several links that I have given you if you want to go and look up more, um, kind of as a starting point to looking up more, because there is a lot to find out about these things. All right, here we go with chapters 9, 10, and 11 from book two of The Recollections of Joan of Arc by Mark Twain, read for us by John Greenman. Here we go. Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc by Mark Twain, Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 9, She is Made General-in-Chief. It was indeed a great day, and a stirring thing to see. She had won. It was a mistake of Trumui and her other ill-wishers to let her hold court those nights. The commission of priests sent to Lorraine, ostensibly to inquire into Joan's character, in fact, to weary her with delays and wear out her purpose and make her give it up, arrived back and reported her character perfect. Our affairs were in full career now, you see. The verdict made a prodigious stir. Dead France woke suddenly to life wherever the great news travelled, whereas before the spiritless and cowed people hung their heads and slunk away if one mentioned war to them, now they came clamouring to be enlisted under the banner of the Maid of Vaucouleurs, and the roaring of war-songs and the thundering of the drums filled all the air. I remembered now what she had said that time there in our village, when I proved by facts and statistics that France's case was hopeless, and nothing could ever rouse the people from their lethargy. They will hear the drums, and they will answer. They will march. It has been said that misfortunes never come one at a time, but in a body. In our case it was the same with good luck. Having got a start, it came flooding in tide after tide. Our next wave of it was of this sort. There had been grave doubts among the priests as to whether the church ought to permit a female soldier to dress like a man. But now came a verdict on that head. Two of the greatest scholars and theologians of the time, one of whom had been Chancellor of the University of Paris, rendered it. They decided that since Joan must do the work of a man and a soldier, it is just and legitimate that her apparel should conform to the situation. It was a great point gained, the Church's authority to dress as a man. Oh, yes, wave on wave the good luck came sweeping in. Never mind about the smaller waves. Let us come to the largest one of all, the wave that swept us small fry quite off our feet and almost drowned us with joy. The day of the great verdict, couriers had been dispatched to the king with it, and the next morning bright and early the clear notes of a bugle came floating to us on the crisp air, and we pricked up our ears and began to count them. One, two, three, pause. One, two, pause. One, two, three, again. And out we skipped and went flying, for that formula was used only when the king's herald at arms would deliver a proclamation to the people. As we hurried along, people came racing out of every street and house and alley, men, women, and children all flushed, excited, and throwing lacking articles of clothing on as they ran. Still those clear notes pealed out, and still the rush of people increased till the whole town was abroad and streaming along the principal street. At last we reached the square, which was now packed with citizens, and there, high on the pedestal of the great cross, we saw the herald in his brilliant costume, with his servitors about him. The next moment he began his delivery in the powerful voice proper to his office. "'Know all men, and take heed, therefore, that the Most High, the Most Illustrious Charles, by the grace of God King of France, hath been pleased to confer upon his well-beloved servant Joan of Arc, called the Maid, the title, emoluments, authorities, and dignity of General-in-Chief of the Armies of France. Here a thousand caps flew in the air, and the multitude burst into a hurricane of cheers that raged and raged, till it seemed as if it would never come to an end. But at last it did. Then the herald went on and finished. And hath appointed to be her lieutenant and chief of staff 
a prince of his royal house, his grace, the Duke of Alencon. That was the end, and the hurricane began again, and was split up into innumerable strips by the blowers of it, and wafted through all the lanes and streets of the town. General of the armies of France, with a prince of the blood for subordinate. Yesterday she was nothing. Today she was this. Yesterday she was not even a sergeant, not even a corporal, not even a private. Today, with one step, she was at the top. Yesterday she was less than nobody to the newest recruit. Today her command was law to La Hire, saint Ray, the Bastard of Orléans, and all those other veterans of old renown, illustrious masters of the trade of war. These were the thoughts I was thinking. I was trying to realize this strange and wonderful thing that had happened, you see. My mind went traveling back and presently lighted upon a picture, a picture which was still so new and fresh in my memory that it seemed a matter of only yesterday, and indeed its date was no further back than the first days of January. This is what it was, a peasant girl in a far-off village, her seventeenth year not yet quite completed, and herself and her village as unknown as if they had been on the other side of the globe. She had picked up a friendless wanderer somewhere and brought it home, a small gray kitten in a forlorn and starving condition, and had fed it and comforted it and got its confidence and made it believe in her, and now it was curled up in her lap asleep, and she was knitting a coarse stocking and thinking, dreaming, about what? One may never know. And now the kitten had hardly had time to become a cat, and yet already the girl is general of the armies of France, with a prince of the blood to give orders to, and out of her village obscurity her name has climbed up like the sun, and is visible from all corners of the land. It made me dizzy to think of these things, they were so out of the common order, and seemed so impossible. End of chapter 9 Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc by Mark Twain Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 10 The Maid's Sword and Banner Joan's first official act was to dictate a letter to the English commanders at Orléans, summoning them to deliver up all strongholds in their possession and depart out of France. She must have been thinking it all out before and arranging it in her mind. It flowed from her lips so smoothly and framed itself into such vivacious and forcible language. Still, it might not have been so. She always had a quick mind and a capable tongue, and her faculties were constantly developing in these latter weeks. This letter was to be forwarded presently from Blois. Men, provisions, and money were offering in plenty now, and Joan appointed Blois as a recruiting station and depot of supplies, and ordered up La Hire from the front to take charge. The great bastard, him of the ducal house and governor of Orléans, had been clamoring for weeks for Joan to be sent to him, and now came another messenger, old Dolon, a veteran officer, a trusty man and fine and honest. The king kept him, and gave him to Joan to be chief of her household, and commanded her to appoint the rest of her people herself, making their number and dignity accord with the greatness of her office. And at the same time he gave order that they should be properly equipped with arms, clothing, and horses. Meantime the king was having a complete suit of armor made for her at Tours. It was of the finest steel, heavily plated with silver, richly ornamented with engraved designs and polished like a mirror. Joan's voices had told her that there was an ancient sword hidden somewhere behind the altar of St. Catherine's of Fierbois, and she sent de Metz to get it. The priests knew of no such sword, but a search was made, and sure enough it was found in that place, buried a little way under the ground. It had no sheath and was very rusty, but the priests polished it up and sent it to Tours, whither we were now to come. They also had a sheath of crimson velvet made for it, and the people of Tours equipped it with another, made of cloth of gold. But Joan meant to carry this sword always in battle, so she laid the showy sheaths away, and got one made of leather. It was generally believed that this sword had belonged to Charlemagne, but that was only a matter of opinion. I wanted to sharpen that old blade, but she said it was not necessary, as she should never kill anybody, and should carry it only as a symbol of authority. 
at tours she designed her standard and a scotch painter named james power made it it was of the most delicate white boucassin with fringes of silk for device it bore the image of god the father throned in the clouds and holding the world in his hand two angels knelt at his feet presenting lilies inscription jesus maria on the reverse the crown of france supported by two angels she also caused a smaller standard or pennon to be made whereon was represented an angel offering a lily to the holy virgin everything was humming there at tours every now and then one heard the bray and crash of military music every little while one heard the measured tramp of marching men squads of recruits leaving for blois songs and shoutings and huzzas filled the air night and day the town was full of strangers the streets and inns were thronged the bustle of preparation was everywhere and everybody carried a glad and cheerful face around jones headquarters a crowd of people was always massed hoping for a glimpse of the new general when they got it they went wild but they seldom got it for she was busy planning her campaign receiving reports giving orders dispatching couriers and giving what odd moments she could spare to the companies of great folk waiting in the drawing-rooms as for us boys we hardly saw her at all she was so occupied we were in a mixed state of mind sometimes hopeful sometimes not mostly not she had not appointed her household yet that was our trouble we knew she was being overrun with applications for places in it and that these applications were backed by great names and weighty influence whereas we had nothing of the sort to recommend us she could fill her humblest places with titled folk folk whose relationships would be a bulwark for her and a valuable support at all times in these circumstances would policy allow her to consider us we were not as cheerful as the rest of the town but were inclined to be depressed and worried sometimes we discussed our slim chances and gave them as good an appearance as we could but the very mention of the subject was anguish to the paladin for whereas we had some little hope he had none at all as a rule noel Rengesson was quite willing to let the dismal matter alone but not when the paladin was present once we were talking the thing over when noel said cheer up paladin i had a dream last night and you were the only one among us that got an appointment it wasn't a high one but it was an appointment anyway some kind of a lackey or body servant or something of that kind the paladin roused up and looked almost cheerful for he was a believer in dreams and in anything and everything of a superstitious sort in fact he said with a rising hopefulness i wish it might come true do you think it will come true certainly i might almost say i know it will for my dreams hardly ever fail noel i could hug you if that dream could come true i could indeed to be servant of the first general of france and have all the world hear of it and the news go back to the village and make those gawks stare that always said i wouldn't ever amount to anything wouldn't it be great do you think it will come true noel don't you believe it will i do there's my hand on it noel if it comes true i'll never forget you shake again i should be dressed in a noble livery and the news would go to the village and those animals would say him lackey to the general-in-chief with the eyes of the whole world on him admiring well he has shot up into the sky now hasn't he he began to walk the floor and pile castles in the air so fast and so high that we could hardly keep up with him then all of a sudden all the joy went out of his face and misery took its place and he said oh dear it is all a mistake it will never come true i forgot that foolish business at Toul." i have kept out of her sight as much as i could all these weeks hoping she would forget that and forgive it but i know she never will she can't of course and after all i wasn't to blame i did say she promised to marry me but they put me up to it and persuaded me i swear they did the vast creature was almost crying then he pulled himself together and said remorsefully it was the only lie i've ever told and he was drowned out with a chorus of groans and outraged exclamations and before he could begin again one of dolon's liveried servants appeared and said we were required at headquarters we rose and noel said there what did i tell you i have a presentiment the spirit of prophecy is upon me 
she is going to appoint him and we are to go there and do him homage come along but the paladin was afraid to go so we left him when we presently stood in the presence in front of a crowd of glittering officers of the army joan greeted us with a winning smile and said she appointed all of us to places in her household for she wanted her old friends by her it was a beautiful surprise to have ourselves honored like this when she could have had people of birth and consequence instead but we couldn't find our tongues to say so she was become so great and so high above us now one at a time we stepped forward and each received his warrant from the hand of our chief dolon all of us had honorable places the two knights stood highest then joan's two brothers i was first page and secretary a young gentleman named raymond was second page noel was her messenger she had two heralds and also a chaplain and almoner whose name was jean pascarel she had previously appointed a maitre d'hotel and a number of domestics now she looked around and said but where is the paladin the sieur bertrand said he thought he was not sent for your excellency now that is not well let him be called the paladin entered humbly enough he ventured no farther than just within the door he stopped there looking embarrassed and afraid then joan spoke pleasantly and said i watched you on the road you began badly but improved of old you were a fantastic talker but there is a man in you and i will bring it out it was fine to see the paladin's face light up when she said that will you follow where i lead into the fire he said and i said to myself by the ring of that i think she has turned this braggart into a hero it is another of her miracles i make no doubt of it i believe you said joan here take my banner you will ride with me in every field and when france is saved you will give it me back he took the banner which is now the most precious of the memorials that remain of joan of arc and his voice was unsteady with emotion when he said if i ever disgrace this trust my comrades here will know how to do a friend's office upon my body and this charge i lay upon them as knowing they will not fail me end of chapter ten personal recollections of joan of arc by mark twain volume one book two chapter eleven the war march is begun noel and i went back together silent at first and impressed finally noel came up out of his thinkings and said the first shall be last and the last first there's authority for this surprise but at the same time wasn't it a lofty hoist for our big bull it truly was i am not over being stunned yet it was the greatest place in her gift yes it was there are many generals and she can create more but there is only one standard-bearer true it is the most conspicuous place in the army after her own and the most coveted and honorable sons of two dukes tried to get it as we know and of all the people in the world this majestic windmill carries it off well isn't it a gigantic promotion when you come to look at it there's no doubt about it it's a kind of copy of joan's own in miniature i don't know how to account for it do you yes without any trouble at all that is i think i do noel was surprised at that and glanced up quickly as if to see if i was in earnest he said i thought you couldn't be in earnest but i see you are if you can make me understand this puzzle do it tell me what the explanation is i believe i can you have noticed that our chief knight says a good many wise things and has a thoughtful head on his shoulders one day riding along we were talking about joan's great talents and he said but greatness of all her gifts she has the seeing eye i said like an unthinking fool the seeing eye i shouldn't count on that for much i suppose we all have it no he said very few have it then he explained and made his meaning clear he said the common eye sees only the outside of things and judges by that but the seeing eye pierces through and reads the heart and the soul finding there capacities which the outside didn't indicate or promise and which the other kind of eye couldn't detect he said the mightiest military genius must fail and come to nothing 
if it have not the seeing eye, that is to say, if it cannot read men and select its subordinates with an infallible judgment. It sees, as by intuition, that this man is good for strategy, that one for dash and daredevil assault, the other for patient bulldog persistence, and it appoints each to his right place and wins, while the commander without the seeing eye would give to each the other's place and lose. He was right about Joan, and I saw it. When she was a child and the tramp came one night, her father and all of us took him for a rascal, but she saw the honest man through the rags. When I dined with the governor of Vaucouleurs so long ago, I saw nothing in our two nights, though I sat with them and talked with them two hours. Joan was there five minutes, and neither spoke with them nor heard them speak, yet she marked them for men of worth and fidelity, and they have confirmed her judgment. Whom has she sent for to take charge of this thundering rabble of new recruits at Blois, made up of old disbanded Armagnac raiders, unspeakable hellions every one? Why, she has sent for Satan himself, that is to say, La Hire, that military hurricane, that godless swashbuckler, that lurid conflagration of blasphemy, that Vesuvius of profanity, forever in eruption. Does he know how to deal with that mob of roaring devils? better than any man that lives, for he is the head-devil of this world his own self. He is the match of the whole of them combined, and probably the father of most of them. She places him in temporary command until she can get to Blois herself, and then, why, then she will certainly take them in hand personally, or I don't know her as well as I ought to, after all these years of intimacy. That will be a sight to see that fair spirit in her white armor, delivering her will to that muck-heap, that rag-pile, that abandoned refuse of perdition. La Hire, cried Noel, our hero of all these years. I do want to see that man. I, too. His name stirs me just as it did when I was a little boy. I want to hear him swear. Of course, I would rather hear him swear than another man pray. He is the frankest man there is, and the naivest. Once when he was rebuked for pillaging on his raids, he said it was nothing. Said he, If God the Father were a soldier, he would rob. I judge he is the right man to take temporary charge there at Bois. Joan has cast the seeing eye upon him, you see. Which brings us back to where we started. I have an honest affection for the paladin, and not merely because he is a good fellow, but because he is my child. I made him what he is the windiest blusterer and most Catholic liar in the kingdom. I'm glad of his luck, but I hadn't the seeing eye. I shouldn't have chosen him for the most dangerous post in the army. I should have placed him in the rear to kill the wounded and violate the dead. Well, we shall see. Joan probably knows what is in him better than we do. And I'll give you another idea. When a person in Joan of Arc's position tells a man he is brave, he believes it, and believing it is enough. In fact, to believe yourself brave is to be brave. It is the one only essential thing. "'Now you've hit it!' cried Noel. "'She's got the creating mouth as well as the seeing eye. Ah, yes, that is the thing. France was cowed and a coward. Joan of Arc has spoken, and France is marching with her head up.' I was summoned now to write a letter from Joan's dictation. During the next day and night our several uniforms were made by the tailors, and our new armor provided. We were beautiful to look upon now, whether clothed for peace or war. Clothed for peace, in costly stuffs and rich colors, the paladin was a tower dyed with the glories of the sunset. Plumed and sashed and ironclad for war, he was a still statelier thing to look at. Orders had been issued for the march toward Blois. It was a clear, sharp, beautiful morning. As our showy great company trotted out in column, riding two and two, Joan and the Duke of Alençon in the lead, Dolon and the big standard-bearer next, and so on, we made a handsome spectacle, as you may well imagine. And as we ploughed through the cheering crowds, with Joan bowing her plumed head to the left and right, and the sun glinting from her silver mail, the spectators realized that the curtain was rolling up before their eyes upon the first act of a prodigious drama and their rising hopes were expressed in an enthusiasm that increased with each moment, until at last one seemed to even physically feel the concussion of the huzzas as well as hear them. 
far down the street we heard the softened strains of wind-blown music and saw a cloud of lancers moving the sun glowing with a subdued light upon the massed armor but striking bright upon the soaring lance-heads a vaguely luminous nebula so to speak with a constellation twinkling above it and that was our guard of honor it joined us the procession was complete the first war march of joan of arc was begun the curtain was up All right, so these three chapters really are kind of setting up the chess pieces on the board. We usually hit a series of chapters that do this before we get into more action-y bits of the stories that we read. This was no different. Some things to know. Delon, D-apostrophe-A-U-L-O-N. He was a real guy. He was the real head of household who was assigned to Joan of Arc. He had been the chief of household for... Yolanda d'Anjou, the good one, the one who finally got the Dauphin to listen to Joan. He then was brought in by Charles VI, and he was made captain of the royal guards. He was treated very well after Joan of Arc's campaigns. He basically got what Joan should have gotten from Charles VII. So he's a, he's a real guy. He's well-known and he's particularly well-known, I mean, well-known on his own, but he's also particularly well-known because during the trial of reconciliation, he was quite a large part of getting that thing moving and testifying. So, good guy. We like him. He's not a friend from childhood, but he is a good guy. The next thing is the standard in the sword. Okay, the sword that was found at St. Catherine's Chapel, and I've given you a link in the show notes out to that as well, actually to the page of the chapel. There has been a chapel on that site for a thousand years, almost. No, I guess it's been about a thousand years now. The original one burnt down and it was rebuilt, but there were lots of legends and stories about who, what, how, all this stuff about the chapel. There had not been any stories about a sword having been buried there. Not any that could be attributed to a specific time and place. The one rumor that was spinning around about this was way off in time. Like a sword that had been used in the Crusades was attributed to being owned by a guy who wasn't alive during the Crusades. He was alive a hundred years earlier. So there was a lot of that kind of thing going on around this. But she has this vision. St. Catherine is one of her saints. She has Catherine, Margaret, and Michael. She sends a guy to go dig behind the altar. This place is marked in the chapel right now. If you go, you can find a little tiny microscopic alcove with like fleur de lis arrows pointing down like sword found here. It really was. It is written about in other contemporary texts and notes that were made at the time. It was evidently rusty and the rust just fell away when the monks brushed it and it was a very important sword for Joan, and it was lost. So there's that. And it was lost before Joan was captured, I think. I can only imagine how that must have felt like the voice of doom to Joan. However, the other things that do not exist anymore, and again, why? Because the French Revolution. There's a lot of burning that happened <laughs> during the French Revolution. So several of the things that got burnt were the standard, the pelon, and the banner. So we non-military history types have probably found ourselves unwittingly using these terms as interchangeable, as all talking about the same thing. They are not. And anyone who is into military textiles already knows what I'm about to tell you. First, there is a standard. The standard is probably what you're thinking. Very tall pole, very large fabric piece that could whip in the wind and be quite extraordinary and rabble-rousing kind of, hurrah, let's follow the standard because we can see it from here. The reason you could see it from there is because the pole that it was on was most likely a battle lance, which was somewhere around five meters or close to 15 feet, maybe even a little longer, depending on whose war you were in. That is big. That is really big. And when you add wind, it's really heavy. And then when you add in the fact that the, <laughs> the standard 
triangular in shape, like an isosceles triangle, is around three feet, so a meter or, or more, at the point at which it connects to the pole, and then it goes out in its triangular shape another 12 feet or three and a half meters. And then, depending on how much weight you wanted to throw on your standard bearer, the little tails, it cut into like a fish tail, like two little pointy bits at the end, that could be another meter of fabric. Okay? So, dude, super heavy. Really, really heavy. This did have very, very specifically painted upon it, as Joan was told to request, uh, Lily's fleur de lis. And then she wanted the names Jesus and Mary, which, when written in the Gothic font that would have been appropriate at the time, was spelled Jehesus. This is where it comes from J H E S U S. And then instead of Mary, it says Maria. It said them back to back, so it looked like Jehesus Maria. Then close to the part where it connects to the pole would have been uh, Jesus with a halo sitting there, one hand cradling the world, the other hand up in the little peace blessing. On, the, on his right hand, Gabriel holding a lily. He is representing mercy. And on Jesus' left hand would be Michael. His hands are holding a sword pointing up. The lily is on a stalk pointing up. Sword in Michael's hand pointing up representing justice. Sitting possibly on kind of a rainbowy area, maybe. That I'm not so sure about. But either way, all of that information actually comes from Joan from the trials. So that is, in her own words, what you hear from Mark Twain is basically what Joan says. You only got a standard if you were a knight who led a company of men at arms. Then you had a standard. If you were the standard bearer, you had a special saddle that gave you a lot of core protection. It had a big wooden part in the front and kind of a not quite so big, but still big enough wooden part in the back. And that helped hold you up while you held this monstrosity. Then there's a smaller triangular, I want to say flag, ensign. The word flag hadn't been invented yet. Ensign was the word that was used at the time in French. I think I said it was a pennon. It's not. It's a pennon, P-E-N-O-N, like a pennant. So a pennon, this would locate you, you on the field. When people talk about Joan carrying her standard, there is no way that this little five-foot-tall thing could have carried the standard. She could have very easily carried the pennon because the pole that it was on could have been anywhere from five to ten feet. And you figure if it was even just a little bit taller than her, that's still a lot to carry. But the pennon was about two feet, maybe two and a half feet tall at the point where it connects to the pole. And this one's a right angle, so it's squared off on the bottom. The angle comes down from the top of the pole, and it goes out maybe three, three to five feet. This one, Joan had requested to have the Annunciation painted on. So you have uh, Mary, you have the angel announcing that she is going to have Jesus, and there's every likelihood that there was a, a little blue background painted above that with a dove on it, with obviously the olive branch, and a little banner coming off from the side saying, De pas le roi du ciel, the king of heaven commands it, which is something that Joan said often in her trial as well. Why did you do this? My king in heaven sort of demanded it. People who were uh, a squire, the head of the foot soldiers, would often carry uh, the pennon. The main knight would take it and use it if the knight got down off his horse to go fight on foot, because obviously it's easier to carry at that point. And then with Joan of Arc, I read in one place that it was very likely that her pennon also marked the point at which her archers were stationed on the field. Then the last bit is a banner. A banner is a square-ish, it's a rectangle, but it's a square-ish rectangle that was used as a, it's me, I am here, this is my banner. Joan's banner for her purposes when they were not fighting was also used as a communion served here banner. So there are three important pieces of fabric, all of them linen buckram, 
the way that they got the gold in, it wasn't gold thread, which is what I had assumed. It was, they had kind of a fatty, sticky mixture that they would paint onto the buckram, and then they would pound gold leaf into the fabric. So like the, the flakes of gold leaf get stuck in on both sides because it's only one layer of fabric. So the fleur-de-lis would show on both sides. Now, when it gets to Jesus and Mary, on the other side, it probably didn't say Jesus and Mary because it would have been backwards. They painted over the gold leaf on the back side with the shield and olive branches and stuff. The part of the banner that had Jesus and the two angels probably showed in reverse on the back. So it was painted in a way that the paint would go through and they knew that and that was going to be fine. It was a Scotsman who was commissioned to do this. The receipt exists. We know who, who painted it. We no longer have it. Joan's pennon uh, evidently got burned a bit. It was after the Siege of Orléans. It was way later in the campaign, which was, you know, upsetting to Joan. But it happens. And yeah, everything that was left, everything that was left was lost or burnt. Lost or burnt or lost, which is just lousy. I have linked up to several pages, though, of people doing their own scholarship and people reporting on other people's scholarship. And it is hilarious to watch Joan of Arc aficionados, devotees, uh, diss each other's research, especially about this. There are several reasons why this could not have been what Joan of Arc's banner looked like. Somebody came up with the fact that the fleur-de-lis had to be on a field of blue. No, actually, no. Joan mentions nothing any of the times that she is questioned about her banner. It is white fabric. The end, it has silk trim around the edges. This was fairly standard and typical. It was about an inch worth of silk braiding and, and ruffling around the edges. So, some guy just decided he liked blue and thought that would look good. So he painted his own version of Joan of Arc's thing, and the other researchers just were not happy about that. So there's a lot of back and forthing about what these things actually looked like. But there is no question, they were hugely important at the time, hugely important to Joan, and she was heavily questioned about why they were designed this way, who told her to design them this way, and if the king, the Dauphin, if Charles VII had asked her to march under his banner, would she have done it? And her response was, I do what my king in heaven commands. And that's it. All right, so more next week. And until then, take care. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Wear a mask. Be safe. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group, which is Craftlit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlit. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>